Hi, this is the last episode of this introductory course, and this one's gonna be a bit different. Unlike previous episodes, which were almost completely devoted to crease pattern design, this one will have grid definition as its main topic. I know, it may sound strange to devote an entire episode to something seemingly very simple and unimportant, but in my experience, many people found grid definition quite daunting. Or to be more precise, people do not find grid definition itself so much problematic, but they do find its implementation on a piece of paper really challenging. As you've most likely already realized, it is not a big deal to crease a piece of paper so we can get an appropriate grid when the number of squares is a multiple of two. You just have to divide the paper in half, then divide each obtained section in half again and so on. That's why all examples in this course are based on an 8x8 grid. You see since 8 is a multiple of 2, it is extremely easy to fold such a grid. But what if the number of squares is not a multiple of 2? How to divide a paper into a grid, whose squares, cannot be obtained by consecutive halving of a paper. What if we need, for example, a 12 by 12 grid? What in that case? Well, the procedure is, strangely enough, very simple and straightforward. First, we need to break down the needed number of squares into prime factors. Meaning, we have to split it into a group of prime numbers that multiplied together, produce our grid size. If you've forgotten it from primary school, let me remind you that prime numbers are those that cannot be divided further. For example, prime numbers are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11 and so on. I hope you know that. So, for our frequently used 8 by 8 grid, factoring prime numbers are 2, 2 and of course another 2, since multiplying 3 2s will produce 8. That's why it is so easy to fold an 8 by 8 grid. That's why we only have to have the paper three times in both directions, and we will get our 8x8 grid. As easy as that. I hope this is clear. Let's go a little further. What if we have a 12x12 grid? What do we do in that case? Well, again we have to divide 12 into prime factors. I hope you've already realized that prime factors of number 12 are 2, another 2 and 3. That means that we have to divide the paper in thirds, and then every third in half, and all six obtained sections in half again. A straightforward procedure, it seems. But it isn't. Do you have an idea how to divide a piece of paper into thirds? Well, to answer that question we'll need a little bit of geometry. Do not worry. Nothing too complicated. We only need elementary school level geometry. As you can see, we're gonna use a square paper. The length of an A is not important, the only thing important is that the paper is a square. That's all. Now, first we have to fold the paper in half along the diagonal. Also, we have to fold the paper along the line that connects the lower right paper corner and the middle of the left square side. Why do we need these creases? Well, let me explain. First, even though you've learned this in primary school, let me remind you that one of primary laws of geometry states that two triangles are considered similar if and only if all their angles are the same. I repeat. The angles are the same, not the sides or edges. Okay? Now, if we look at our drawing, we can see that there are two such triangles, triangles that are similar. Can you see them? Take a good look. The first one is that which has side lengths B and C. This is the red one. The second one is the one having side lengths A and half of an A. This is the blue one. Okay? I hope you can follow. Now, taking into consideration the fact that these triangles are similar, we know that the ratio of lengths C and B is equal to the ratio of lengths A and half of an A. Using a simple mathematical notation this can be written like this. Which, upon rearranging, will produce the following form. An additional rearranging will lead us to this. Finally, we've arrived to the result we'd been looking for. B is equal to a third of an A. This is exactly what we needed. B is exactly a third of an A, which is, as you know, the length of one paper side. All of this means that, if we go back to our initial drawing, we will see that the intersection of our initial two creases defines the length of B, or one third of the paper side. I hope this is clear. Now we only need to divide C in half in order to divide the paper into thirds. For us to divide the paper into twelfths, we merely need to have all the acquired thirds twice. And that's it. I hope everything's been more or less clear so far. Now, another question. How to divide a paper into a 30 by 30 grid? 
there's a simple but not too elegant procedure. Idea is to divide the paper into a 32 by 32 grid, which is something we know how to do, and then simply cut the paper to the appropriate size, to the 30 by 30 grid. This way we do lose a part of the paper, but at least we get what we're looking for. But if we want to divide it properly, without losing any part of the paper, we need to follow the procedure I've shown you in the previous example. Let's see what have to do. First we need to break down 30 into prime factoring numbers. Prime factors of 30 are 2, 3 and 5. This is pretty good combination, since we already know how to divide a paper into halves and thirds. So, the only issue is how to divide a paper into fifths. Let's give it a try. First, as always, we need to fold the paper in half along the diagonal. This first step is always the same, no matter in how many parts we are trying to divide the paper. Then we divide the paper horizontally into fourths. We don't have to do this literally. It is enough to make only small pinches on the left edge. The next step is to fold the paper along the line that connects the lower right corner and the first fourth on the left edge. Now, just like in the previous example, the intersection between these two diagonal lines defines the point we were looking for. Now we only need to fold the vertical crease through that point, through that intersection, and we will divide the paper into two parts, one representing one-fifth and the other four-fifths of the paper edge length. From here on everything is quite simple, since we already know how to divide four-fifths into four equal parts. We surely know, since four is a multiple of two meaning we only have to divide four-fifths in half twice. Now, since we know how to divide a paper into thirds and fifths, we can go back to our example, to our 30 by 30 grid. But first, one simple question. Is it better to divide the paper into thirds first and then into fifths, or it is better to do it vice versa? What do you think? Well, frankly speaking, it's the same. You see all these divisions need to be done only once. Let me show you why. For example, to get a 30 by 30 grid we could first divide a paper into fifths, then only one fifth into thirds, and finally only one third in half. And that's it. We've managed to define the size of the basic unit. You see, that's it. Our square paper with a defined basic unit. So, what we have to do next is simply replicate this basic element throughout whole paper. Like it's some kind of a harmonica. Now that we've gone through these two examples, do you understand the general rule? Well, in case you don't, I'll show you yet another example. Let's for instance try dividing a paper into sevenths. First, as always, we have to fold the paper along its diagonal. This will give us our first diagonal crease. We've come to the important part now. We need to add yet another so-called diagonal that connects the lower right corner of the paper and one point on the left edge of the paper. But, which one? Well, to find this exact point, first we have to divide the left edge by the largest number from the group of multiples of 2. Meaning, from the group that includes numbers 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64 and so on, that is lower than the number of required paper partitions. Might sound complicated, but it's not. Look, since we want to partition the paper into sevenths, it's obvious that we first need to divide the right edge into fourths. I hope you do understand why we have to divide the left edge by 4. You see, 7 is between 4 and 8, and since we have to choose the lower one, it is obvious that we have to choose 4. Okay? So, our first step is to divide the left edge into fourths. Again it is enough just to make small pinches. The point we are interested in is the third one, since 3 is equal to the difference between 7 the number of partitions we are looking for, and 4 the number of partitions we've actually made on the left edge. Meaning, our point is exactly at 3 fourths from the bottom. Do you understand the logic? Earlier, if you remember, when we tried to divide the paper into fifths, we applied the same procedure. We divided the right edge into fourths, since 5 is between 4 and 8, and we had to choose the lower one. Doing that, we chose the first point representing one-fourth of the paper edge, since the difference between 5 and 4 is 1. I hope this is clear. Now, let's finish the partition of our paper into sevenths. What is left is to connect our point at three-fourths with the lower right corner of the paper. What we've got is an intersection that marks the position of the vertical line that defines the paper division into three sevenths and four sevenths. As simple as that. From here on everything is more or less straightforward. You see, on the one side of the division line, we will always have an area that's supposed to be partitioned by number that are multiple of two. Namely, four sevenths should be partitioned by four. I hope you agree that dividing four sevenths into four equally sized sections is easy. Because it indeed is. 
you just need to have the right section twice. This supposed to be super easy to do. Now that we've established the size of the elementary unit, that is we know the width of 1 7th, it is no brainer to replicate this width to the other side of the division line. You only need to fold the paper like a harmonica so you can translate the basic unit width across the paper. Or there is yet another even simpler, and I would say even more precise method. You see, we could borrow one basic unit from 4 7th segment and attached it to the 3 7th segment, thus constructing a new 4 7th segment that could be divided by consecutive having two. As simple as that. There's something interesting I'd like to share with you. The method I've just shown you isn't reserved for prime numbers only. Please remember this. This method can be used to divide a paper into any number of partitions we like. But there could be a little problem. You see, from mathematical standpoint this method is flawless, but the implementation part in some odd cases could be a little bit tricky. The problem is that it's absolutely essential to be very, and I mean very accurate, if we want to define position of an initial vertical division line, while the second diagonal is not steep enough. In other words, if the difference between the number of partitions we are trying to make and the number of partitions we actually made is small. In worst case scenario, if it is only one. For instance, this is the crease pattern of a cricket design by Kota Imai. Maybe it is not obvious, but this model is based on a 33 by 33 grid. As you know, 33 is a prime number itself, so we have to define basic unit size in one take. So can we construct 33 by 33 grid using the shown method? Of course we can. Again, first we have to divide the paper in half along a diagonal. This is always the first step. In addition, we know that 33 is between 32 and 64, so we have to divide the right edge of the paper into 32 equal sections. I hope everything's been clear thus far. Now, since difference between 33, number of partitions we are trying to make, and 32, number of partitions we actually made, is 1, our point of interest is exactly the first one from the bottom. I hope you see the problem. It is quite hard, not to say impossible to fold a paper along this almost horizontal diagonal, especially if the size of a basic unit is small. Believe me, defining such a small basic element in a single take in such odd configuration requires a near impossible precision. So, unless you are a person keen on extreme challenges, my suggestion is to avoid this kind of grids. That'd be all for this origami course. I hope you have enjoyed it.